Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York in Harlem, where there is a monument to American soldiers who fought valiantly in World War I. Black soldiers, nicknamed the Harlem Hellfighters. The monument is a tribute to their battlefield bravery. It is also an implicit condemnation of the country that ignored them for more than a hundred years. The stirring story of the 369th Regiment, next. The Harlem Hellfighters began as the 15th New York National Guard in 1916. It was an all-Black unit of men or soldiers with a majority white officer corps, and it was commanded by a white officer, a Colonel William Hayward. Big Bill Hayward was the New York City Public Service Commissioner. He was He's an all-American football player on the Nebraska football team, but he also studied ROTC under John J. Pershing himself. A lot of uh, white officers wanted nothing to do with it, but Hayward took it as an opportunity because he felt that black soldiers uh, would certainly be able to serve well. They served on the frontier and in previous wars, and he undertook to create the regiment uh, and basically uh, was quite, uh, shall we say, creative in doing it. Hayward thought the unit should have a great band. Luckily, James Reese Europe had enlisted. Europe was the star of the jazz and ragtime world, composer, arranger, band leader. Europe's Cleft Club Orchestra was so renowned that in May of 1912, it performed the first jazz concert at Carnegie Hall. A dance craze was sweeping the country, jump-started by Irene and Vernon Castle, the Fred and Ginger of their day. Europe became their band director. Together, they introduced the country to the Foxtrot in 1914. Wherever Jim Europe's music played, people listen. This spectacular band that went around New York City and the different boroughs, and of course, uh, when they realized James Reese Europe's band was playing, all these young men flocked to the colors. Jim Europe was not only the band leader, he was a lieutenant in the unit's machine gun company. Injured in a gas attack in the trenches of the Western Front, Europe wrote out in no man's land from his hospital bed. The vocalist is early jazz luminary Noble Thistle, the band's drum major. Sissel recruited his best friend, Ubi Blake, to sign on too. In 1921, Sissel and Blake would electrify Broadway with their musical, Shuffle Along, and its hit song, I'm Just Wild About Harry. Colonel Hayward was wild about the band that Jim Europe was creating. What do you hear? Nothing near. Don't fear. All clear. That's the life of a soul. When you take a patrol, out in no man's land. Ain't a grand, out in no man's land. One of the interesting things about Europe is that he actually went to Cuba and Puerto Rico to recruit uh, musicians who uh, played reed instruments. Uh, and uh, so there were lots of Puerto Ricans, especially in the uh, uh, 369th uh, band. William Layton learned to play bugle in his Boy Scout troop in Newark. He hoped one day to play professionally. His friends all enlisted in the 15th Guard Unit. He tried to join them. He was a small frame, uh, slight, skinny, kind of short. He was too small for the service. So he wound up having to go around the corner uh, the, of the recruiting station, <laughs> drink a, a quart of milk and uh, four bananas in order to make the weight to be accepted into the Army. Leander Willett was born to be a soldier. The Willets of Oyster Bay have always fought for their country. 
Our family goes back to the 1760s in the first United States census in Oyster Bay. My grandfather was a laborer for most of his life. He delivered coal. And um, he delivered coal because that was the primary source of heating all around Oyster Bay. And he actually delivered coal to the um, Summer White House when Teddy Roosevelt was president and the Summer White House is in Oyster mm. Bay. Many have asked the question, why did blacks fight in World War I, a war to make the world safe for democracy, when Georgia wasn't safe for black people? African-Americans were looking to, to be considered equal. And he thought it was a, a very good opportunity for him to go into the service and come back uh, as an American, as a, you know, a, a decorated soldier or uh, someone who has fought for his country. We are a patriotic family. Our um, ancestor, Albert Willett, fought as a free man in the Civil War. We have relatives in every war from then up until, you know, the Gulf Wars, where my cousin Leah um, was a Navy nurse. I maintain that these Blacks were fighting more to prove themselves men and to show that they were deserving of full citizenship than they were fighting for America or fighting for uh, a democracy in, in the world, which was a platitude and statement in the first place. The USS Pocahontas arrived in France in December 1917, carrying the 369th Regiment and its band, playing a kind of music not heard before on the continent, ragtime. But there was a rude surprise awaiting the men of the 369th, Instead of uniforms, they were handed work clothes. They were not going to war. They were assigned to unload ships, dig canals, menial labor. General Pershing refused to send them into combat. There's a belief or a pretense that they could not uh, 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 fight, especially in a modern war, that black officers could not be uh, trusted. Uh, they didn't have the smarts. They didn't have the the courage. The South feared that training these men for combat and then letting them fight in Europe would enable them to come back and literally destroy segregation in the South. And they weren't going to tolerate that. Colonel Haywood was outraged. He peppered Pershing to change his mind, said his men were trained to fight, not be laborers. Pershing was adamant. But the war was going badly. The Germans were ripping through France. The French army needed help. The French were desperate for manpower, kept pressuring Pershing to give them troops. And finally, the War Department and Pershing relented, uh, and the 369th was assigned to the French 4th Army. The French welcomed them not only as comrades, but as equals. Suddenly, for the Hellfighters, everything changed. One of the soldiers famously comments um, after coming back from a French estaminet, which would be a pub, he says, you know, the only time I remember I'm black is when I look in the mirror. And he says, I feel very welcome here, and I'm very happy to be fighting for the cause of France. In the perilous trenches of the Western Front, the Hellfighters distinguished themselves. Combat was hand-to-hand, -hand, brutal. William Layton took shrapnel from an artillery attack trying to warn Company K of danger. Captain Hamilton Fish's company he was advancing very quickly against the Germans, and they didn't realize, but they were being actually led into a trap. So my grandfather was acting as a uh, as the messenger between headquarters and the regiment. So they sent him a message to send back to Hamilton to tell them to stop, not advance, and hold ground. Um, just at that time when he was leaving, the Germans laid down a huge barrage of, uh, of uh, artillery and uh, blew him off a hill. They even gassed him. Despite his injuries, Leighton managed to warn the company of the danger. Leander Willett was wounded as well, bayoneted and hit with mustard gas. My father really did not speak very much about his service in the war. I think that the things that they saw there were so 
horrific that they just went back to their normal lives and tried to, you know, put that aside. Henry Johnson, a railroad porter from Albany, became the most decorated GI of the regiment. In May of 1918, in the middle of the night, Private Johnson was on lookout duty at a forward post in the Argonne when Germans attacked behind grenades and artillery fire. Henry Johnson rises to meet them. The first man he shoots with his rifle, which only has three bullets in the clip anyway, with the second man that comes at him, he turns the rifle around very quickly and hits him across the face with the button, knocks him out. A third German breaches the lookout post. Henry Johnson pulls out his bolo knife, leaps on the German shoulders with his knees and plunges the blade all the way down to the butt into his skull. Do you see the cartoons of Henry Johnson? He looks like a linebacker, you know, 6'5", about 250. Henry Johnson was 5 feet 7 inches tall and 129 pounds dripping wet. Henry Johnson's wife was interviewed in Buffalo, and uh, his wife said, you know, she called him Bill. She said, you know, Bill may be small, but in a fight he can go some. Johnson not only killed numerous Germans, he rescued a fellow soldier. Johnson was wounded multiple times. For his heroism, the French awarded Johnson the Croix de Guerre with star and golden palm. In 2015, nearly 100 years after Johnson's heroism, President Obama recognized him with the Medal of Honor. Henry was one of the first Americans to reap France's highest award for valor. But his own nation didn't award him anything, not even the Purple Heart, though he had been wounded 21 times. Now, America can't change what happened to Henry Johnson. We can't change what happened to too many soldiers like him who went uncelebrated because our nation judged them by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. But we can do our best to make it right. In Albany's Washington Park stands a majestic monument to Johnson. Every June 5th, Albany celebrates Henry Johnson Day, the anniversary of his enlistment in the Hellfighters Regiment. The 369th Regiment spent 191 days in combat, longest of any American unit. They never lost a foot of ground, never had a man captured. 367 Hellfighters were killed in action, nearly 1,100 wounded. They received 171 French decorations for valor, but just a handful from the U.S. military. And if these black men thought their bravery abroad would win them equal rights at home, they were mistaken. As it turned out, they weren't. They were received home with race riots in many areas and also lynchings in the South in an attempt to make certain they understood that nothing was going to change in the United States. When it was finally over, over there, the Allied forces marched in victory celebration in Paris, but the 369th heroes were not among them. The unit had been shipped back home. No black American troops marched in that victory parade. General Pershing made sure of that. The 369th did get to celebrate in New York a tumultuous parade of Fifth Avenue from Madison Square Park to Harlem. Huge crowds lined the entire parade route. And there, riding in style in an elegant touring car holding a bouquet of flowers, hero Henry Johnson. These are American stories. It's important, I think, for people to know that the American story is all of us, all colors. I'm joined now by Richard Walling. He's a historian. His specialty is the participation of black Americans, Native Americans in this country's military history. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate the opportunity to share this story with you in the audience. This is all so long ago, you know, 100 years and more ago. How do we know, for instance, the details of Henry Johnson's heroism? Well, uh, at the time, the Hellfighters, which, of course, they weren't called that yet, but they were the most celebrated American regiment, being such a, 
a rarity, a black combat regiment fighting in France. And when Johnson and Roberts uh, did their- Needham uh, Roberts. Needham yeah. Roberts from Trenton, when they did their amazing heroic act of staving off 20, 30 Germans during a patrol, that was national news. It was international news. And even General Pershing issued a, a report citing two men of this regiment, not by name because of military security, but it was national headline news. And addition to reporters happened to be visiting the regiment when that happened. Really? Yes. So reporters from the States were visiting the regiment and they were told, oh, by the way, last night, two of our men just slew <laughs> 20 Germans single-handedly or double-handedly. And the reporters were taken out there. They saw the blood trails. They saw the dead Germans. And they wrote about it. Black soldiers, number one, I think many Americans didn't know that we had black troops fighting in World War I. Number two, that they weren't going to get that kind of attention normally in the American press. Um, how, how surprising. You had a couple of things going on. First of all, again, it was a New York regiment. There was that New York bravado. Oh, of course. And they, the men were uh, very proud of being in the regiment. And there was a, a lack of awareness generally, but the, the reporters just grabbed onto the stories. They said, see, black soldiers, as they had learned during the Civil War with the 54th Massachusetts and other similar regiments, they said, look, we deserve to give black men the opportunity to fight for the country, just not unload ships or build railroads or build warehouses, but to actually fight to defend the American flag and to liberate France. How do we know about William Lane? His story is at one of the key battles of this war, Seychelles, right? Correct. How do we know those details? Well, fortunately, back in 1990, a historian uh, Gail Lumet Buckley, or Gail Buckley, wrote a book called American Patriots. It told the story of black participation in the U.S. military. She actually interviewed William Layton in 1990, took down his story, which otherwise would have been lost, except perhaps within the family, and it became uh, published, distributed, and now 30-some-odd years later, we're talking about it. You are someone who knows the service records of these men, uh, intimately. And if I understand this correctly, uh, the company that Leighton warned of a trap, Company K, which was led by Captain Hamilton Fish, if I understand the records correctly, Leighton wasn't in that company. So there, there's some doubt has crept in about that story. Certainly. So um, just to give a general overview. The regiment was divided into three battalions of about 800, 900 men each. Companies would be within those certain battalions. So Company L and Company K were in the same battalion. And which one was, was Leighton in? Leighton was in Company L. Ah. But when you're in combat, you're going in echelon with your other companies in line. So if, if Captain Fish is 30 yards away from Private uh, Leighton, Within minutes, within moments of combat, they, they would be right next to each other. So, so true, they were in separate companies, but in combat, that, that really became irrelevant. And what he did was at Seychelles, which uh, was a pivotal battle in this war. What was the importance of what the, what the 369th accomplished there? The 369th was part of the 4th French Army. They were in the Champagne region of France. And for years, the French had tried to crack the German line there. And tens of thousands of Frenchmen had died trying to crack that line. Beginning in July and ending on Armistice Day, November 18th, 1918, the Allies in general had a uh, Western theater uh, size or wide push against the German line. And the 369th went into combat at Seychelles, uh, leading up to the village, and after three or four days of extremely heavy combat, they broke the back of the German defense in that section of the line. And once they were, the regiment was decimated, they took 60% casualties. Once they broke that line, the, the rest of their French uh, allies were able to push through and drive the Germans back. And within, within a month and a half, the war had ended. 
The French rewarded the 369th with all kinds of decorations, uh, Croix de Guerre and everything. Not many of those men got U.S. decorations for anything they did in the, in the war. Why? Well, only a handful received the Distinguished Service Cross, which is one grade below the Medal of Honor. Only a handful. A couple of reasons. The main reason, of course, being the Army Brass, which was generally followed the Southern officer's point of view, did not want to give recognition to black soldiers. It was as simple as that. Racism. Um, We're talking racism, racism. absolutely. Um, tangentially, though, another black regiment a little bit further down the line who fought with the famous Lost Battalion, for example, in that sector, mm -hmm. a few miles away, that regiment did receive a number of U.S. awards, which leads to the second reason is because the 369th, which was their federal designation, they were serving with a French army. So the paperwork chain from a, a commander of a unit in the French mm -hmm. army going to General Pershing, there were a lot of gaps along the way. And many, many men who were recommended for medals the paperwork simply never got passed up along the line. Richard, do we, I, it, it'd be a good time to explain this uh, uh, nickname, Hellfighters, which really wasn't what the men called themselves. Their Colonel Bill Hayward, who was a Nebraskan, by the way, uh, he actually led his men into battle at Seychelles. And during the attack, he ripped off his epaulots grabbed a rifle, and led his men into combat. This is a colonel, the leader of the, uh, the regiment? Yes. Doing this? You would expect that in the American Civil War. You would not expect it. You would not expect it in World War I. The officers would be in the back. So when the press heard about this, the, the uh, men called him the hell colonel because of his bravery. Not in a derogatory sense. No, no, I understand. Right. I get it. Right. And so the press said, oh, hell colonel, hell fight, the hell fighters, that nickname became attached to the regiment after their return. And of course, Jim Europe, the great Jim Europe, the jazz king of Broadway, great, great man. He named his band the Hell Fighter Band and planned a nationwide tour and a tour to France. But that got cut short in, in later that year of 1919 by a very tragic incident. Yeah, his death. Um, the men called themselves the Harlem Rattlers. Correct. Which uh, is the title of what I think could be described as a definitive work, definitive history of the 369th by uh, Jeffrey Sammons and John Morrow. And it's called the Harlem Rattlers. Correct. And so when but, they were kind of trying to devise a um, unit insignia, they took the Don't Tread on Me rattlesnake. Ah, sure. Uh, made it black on a black patch, and it's still the, the insignia for the modern day equivalent of the regiment. And they call themselves the Rattlers. Don't tread on me, don't tread on our tail. But the press chose the Hellfighters as what to call these men because they really were Hellfighters. You wrote a book, uh, My Year in France, about another Hellfighter, Sergeant Peterson. Right. Um, Tell me about him. So uh, Sergeant Clinton Peterson was uh, a young man from Putnam County. He was born in the poorhouse, the Putnam County poorhouse. Mm -hmm. When the regiment was formed in 1916 as the 15th New York National Guard, he joined and he rose through the ranks and he happened to be a near neighbor of Captain Hamilton Fish. Ah. He and Fish became very, very close wartime buddies. And of course, you know, there was the class distinction, there was the racial distinction, but in the army, for fish anyway, that didn't matter. And Peterson stayed uh, with the regiment when the war was over. He rose to the rank of an officer, was anxious to get into World War II when they were mobilized again as in a coastal artillery unit. But unfortunately, he passed away. But he, he epitomizes the American dream. Born in the poorhouse, worked for the post office, became a solid middle-class resident of New York City and was honored. In fact, in 1930, in the 30s, when Roosevelt was elected, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he was one of the officers on the dais or on the platform with President Roosevelt as a representative of his regiment. These men were the fathers of the Harlem Renaissance. 
you had men like Noble Sissel and UB Blake, who was Jim Europe's business partner. These men were leaders in the community. They were leaders um, in the arts. And Horace Pippen, of course, is a well-known black artist who uh, lost an arm during World War I with this regiment. And art became his uh, method of recovery, um, rehabilitation. The greatest legacy, I know you've mentioned the monument. At the time, and this is 100 years ago, at the time, the armory was their monument. The, the Harlem Armory. Right, the 369th Armory. And for decades, it was the centerpiece of Harlem. And that's their lasting monument. Good time, uh, Richard, for me to mention uh, that at the beginning of the program, I did show that monument. And I called it an implicit condemnation of this country for ignoring these men. And what I meant is that that monument is just a copy of one in Seychelles, France, that the French erected to the valor of these men, celebrating these men. There are no U.S. monuments to the 369th Regiment. Recently, they were given the uh, Congressional Gold Medal. Maybe one day uh, the monument will come. Richard Walling, thank you. Thank you, Tony. And thank you for watching.